Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Invest Like a Boss. On this week's episode, we have an awesome guest, Simon Black. Man, sovereign man himself. I'm so excited that we got him on the show. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, we've been following Simon for a long time. And I have to say, it's one of the few publications that I've stuck with over the course of several years. And I got to be honest, it's shaped a lot of the way that I think about the world, travel, investments, and, and lots of other things. So I just signed up for his mailing list pretty recently, but I've actually been really enjoying the newsletters that he sends out. So I'm really excited to have him on the show. The kind of one thing that I have been kind of reading up on is there's a book called Emergency by Neil Strauss. Have you read mm-hmm. that? I have not, no. In that book, he kind of talks about you know uh, how to get a second passport and mm-hmm. what to do if kind of the U.S. Um, you know uh, goes through another another period of um, I don't want to say depression, but yeah. you know some kind of financial uh, issues. And it's one of the things where there's two sides to it. One is we can just you know we can become conspiracy theorists and just overthink mm-hmm. it, or we can just kind of assume that the government knows what they're doing, everything's gonna be fine. Mm-hmm. I kind of like uh, Simon's approach where he's you know he is more proactive about it. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, their whole approach is to do things that matter anyways. You know, holding some cash in a bank is it's a good idea to do anyways. Right. Having an overseas bank, it's a good idea to do anyways. Holding a little bit of precious metals. It's great to do anyways. But what really excites me about the guy is his travel schedule and his international network. So I'm really looking forward to asking him how he leverages that for his own personal investing. I mean, I know you and I travel a lot, but dude, (laughs) Simon puts us to total shame. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna have to have him on the Travel Like a Boss podcast as well. <laughs> <laughs> but in this episode, you know, we'll definitely uh, make sure that, that you ask more about the the financial side, investment side, because I know everyone listening to this is excited about what to invest in, uh, how much they should invest in gold. There's other alternatives besides precious metals and all that good stuff. Yeah. So. I- Hopefully, uh, we'll come away with some tidbits. Guys, stay tuned after the show. Johnny and I have a little bit of a recap on some of the key takeaways with Simon Black. And everyone, enjoy the episode. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Invest Like a Boss. We have a very special guest today, none other than Simon Black of Sovereign Man. Simon, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Thanks for inviting me. I have to apologize a little bit because I'm currently in the Ukraine and it's the Independence Day. So it's impossible to find a quiet spot anywhere in the city. So if anyone hears tanks or kids screaming or parades going by, they they, they know why. But um, where are you currently located, Simon? Are, are, you, are you in Kiev? I came from Kiev. I was there for a wedding and I just came over to Lviv. Oh, okay. Nice town. Very yeah, nice. It's, it's um, I'm beautiful. in uh, I'm in Santiago, Chile. Um, I'm here probably about uh, I'm in Chile about six months out of the year uh, or so. So I've got a I've got an apartment and uh, an office here and and lots of land and, and things like that. So I'm sort of in my uh, in my my spring and, and, and summer phase down here in South America. Uh, that sounds beautiful. A nice place for some rest and relaxation, I'm sure as well. And are you typically in Santiago or? I'm in Santiago usually during the week, and then uh, which uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll probably talk about. I um, I've got uh, a lot of farmland down here. Uh, I found it and 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 I'm running the pretty much the largest agricultural project of its kind down here. So we've got thousands and thousands of acres of land growing uh, blueberries and walnuts and things like that. So all over central and southern Chile. Uh, so I spend a lot of time down south at, uh, at our farms and it's just absolutely gorgeous being out there. It's just almost every day. It's like bright blue sunny skies, gorgeous views of the Andes, you know, growing organic food. It's, uh, it, it's, it's really incredible. It's great down here. Uh, it's absolute heaven and it's another place that I was turned on to initially just by uh, by Sovereign Man. And I was fortunate enough to go down last uh, September and it went from all the way the far north dry desert all the way to the, the tippy tip south all over land. And what a spectacular country. The diversity of, of what you can get is just incredible in one country. Yeah, the Chile is like, you know, sort of the northern hemisphere flipped upside down. It's like if you were to go from central Baja, Mexico, all the way up to southeastern Alaska. So all the diversity that you get in that kind of landscape uh, is what you get just in, in, in one country in Chile. And it's, it's pretty spectacular. I got to ask you, are you biased towards Chilean wine now? 
Uh, well, I've grown it for years, so I've got, I've got, uh, I mean, I, I have, I have more wine in my warehouse, uh, in my, my bodega, they call it here, than uh-huh. to last me a hundred lifetimes, probably, so I, I do, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit biased, uh, to, to, to mostly it's probably towards my own wine. Yeah, so it's, it's funny, I, since I no longer have a residence in the USA, I, I, got a little wine cellar and sent it to my parents house so in my parents garage they have a whatever the, the big wine cooler and while i was down there literally every single vineyard i went to i just fell in love with the wine so i shipped back a case so back at my parents house at home if uh if i ever return for a visit i have uh, pretty much unlimited chilean wine which i always look forward to it's an interesting thing that that you bring that up because um uh, one of the things that i love about chile and, and this may be actually quite applicable to to this podcast and your mm-hmm. audience is that i view chile as uh, as really an interesting land of opportunity um there's uh there's a lot of money here there's a lot of wealth here um and yet there's uh a kind of an interesting uh a buddy of mine calls it uh, cultural arbitrage mm-hmm. um here there's uh, there are a lot of things that are not done to the highest possible standard and for um financially minded entrepreneurial minded people it actually presents a lot of opportunity and the wine business is, is actually is actually one of those um if you look in other places around the world if, if you've got uh, some of your listeners happen to be um, really into wine. You know, mm-hmm. obviously there's great, wonderful Italian and South African and Australian and French wines and so forth. And and Chilean wine is good quality and it's great quality for the money, um, but it's not necessarily ranked as like the best wine on the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of that is because uh, just the way that they they process it kind of more scientifically and uh and so there's some guys that are now starting to come down to chile where the land prices are very cheap and the production cost to grow the grapes and so forth are incredibly inexpensive and so they're coming down here and they're growing their own grapes and turning it into you know they're taking sort of the european winemaking art form which is again more artistic more playful uh where you know you treat the wine instead of as a science it's this art of you know taking something that's living and breathing and and making it this the, the tastiest thing mm-hmm. possible that you can put in a bottle um and they're actually doing extremely well um, in these sort of boutique vineyards. This is a concept that's existed for hundreds and hundreds of years in Europe and uh, and uh, you know really all, in many places around the world, but it doesn't really exist in Chile. And there are guys now that are taking that model from other countries and they're bringing that down here and they're doing extremely well. Um, we've done that a little bit ourselves and it's been, it's been really interesting um, as just as an example of barely even scratching the surface of the kind of opportunities um, that exist in a place like this and, and that are out there if you really you know start looking uh, for those unique opportunities yeah absolutely i really love the grape down there i think it was a carmenier that they only they found they used to, yeah so it used to be in france i believe and then they they got they lost it and they, they found it in chile some some time ago and it only exists in chile now that's right uh it, uh, it's originally from bordeaux and uh and the grape was uh basically lost in the plague and they thought it was just uh, they thought it was extinct they thought it was wiped from the earth forever mm-hmm. and then they found it in chile and now it grows almost exclusively uh, in chile and that's actually what our uh, our wine is it's a, it's a carmenere grape it's oh, well. medium bodied and it's it's fantastic beautiful we'll have to try it sometime and uh so you how many months a year? Uh, months a year you're traveling. You mentioned you're in in Santiago or in Chile six months a year. Does that mean you're you're pretty much traveling the other six months? That's right. Yeah. So I I do that for a couple of reasons. One is because. I don't like spending winter anywhere, even as mild as the winters are in Chile. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I've been back. It's still technically winter down here, but I'm, for the last week and a half, it was just bright blue sunny skies. On Monday, we were down at one of our farms. We've got mm-hmm. a, about a, I think, 2,700 acre farm where we're growing walnuts um, in central Chile. I mean, it was it was 26 Celsius, I think. It was like probably 75, Beautiful. 78 degrees, yeah. something like that Fahrenheit. Yeah. Bright blue sunny skies, just gorgeous, warm. Um, so, but even still, I just don't like spending winter anywhere. So I, I get two summers a year. Uh, I get the northern hemisphere summers and the southern hemisphere summers. But mostly, I'm also traveling to to maintain relationships with mm-hmm. the, the pretty vast network of people that I've gotten in touch with over the years, as well as to go and see firsthand, you know, various business and investment opportunities on the ground all over the world. And and this is something that I. Um, you know, that I've really specialized in over the years is just trying to see, uh, uh, look, I, I write about this kind of stuff a lot. I mean, there's there are a lot of issues, there are a lot of challenges in the world. Mm-hmm. There are entire, you know, governments that are basically bankrupt. The levels of debt in the world are 
uh, are extreme at record levels. Interest rates are at 5,000 year lows. Uh, there are negative interest rates in a lot of countries, banks mm-hmm. that are starting to charge savers, uh, pension funds that have been rendered insolvent. There are clearly a lot of issues, but uh, um, I don't really, you know, I'm not a pessimistic guy. I'm actually quite optimistic, and I see so many opportunities around the world. Uh, they're just not really in the mainstream. Um, I think most of the really great investment opportunities that exist in the world are are unconventional. They're out of the mainstream, and uh, make it a point to go to and, and, and find those places, you know, firsthand with uh, with boots on the ground and, and and see that stuff. And and that's one of the big reasons why I do um, pretty consistently travel uh, again, probably about six months out of the year. Yeah, I love it. And for the listeners out there, if you follow Simon Black and Sovereign Man, they put out a daily or at least uh, each is it each day of the week or the business week or all seven days you put out the, the newsletter? Oh, yeah, it's, it's more or less Monday through Friday. So it's so it goes out every week and it's almost always in a new location, which is really, really interesting. Um, so Simon travels at a blistering pace at least six months of the year. So how many how many countries have you been to now? Oh, uh, 120 something. Jeez. So that, that puts Johnny and I to shame. I think I think I've just crossed 90. But what I realized is after 90 or 100, you really have to truly stretch yourself to find a place that you really, really want to go to, or at least me particularly. Um are there places that you have little desire to go back to, or is every place that you travel oh, yeah. a learning experience? <laughs> well, no, there's, <laughs> there's definitely places that I could do without going back to. Uh, and there's, there are, there are at this point. There's, I mean, I went to when I went to Antarctica. Um, last year mm-hmm. and i thought okay I've, I've, I've pretty much officially crossed the rubicon now there's not there's not really any places that i really want to go to that i right. haven't been there's only actually one place left mm-hmm. um and that's that's iran and i have a very difficult time just because of my my background as a as an yeah. intelligence officer and so it's 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 hard for me uh mm-hmm. to to get in so i haven't been to iran um and i i do want to go and i'm i'm sure that uh, a lot of that stuff will change, and I'll get there eventually. But uh, pretty much everywhere else that I've at least wanted to go to, I've been. Mm-hmm. But it's all relative, man. I mean, you know, I I go, I spend a lot of time with with Jim Rogers, and I think I've been to a lot of countries, you know. And you know, Jim spent years of his life driving around the world in his big Mercedes, yeah. Uh, yeah. going from one country to the next. I mean, he, so he's he's been to more countries that even exist at this point. So it it really is all relative. Yeah, the adventure capitalist, one of our favorite books, a book that we always encourage people to listen to and or listen to and or read. Um, and that was really inspiring. When, when I see your travel path, I think of that a lot and a lot of the places that we travel, even though that's, it's not necessarily maybe the, the top place we'd want to be at that time. You know, you, of course, learn something from every, uh, every area. And like Jim, you know, Jim was investing in things in a lot of the places he was going to, as are you. So there's always, always great takeaways. And then there's the places that, uh, that you could do without, like you said. Yeah. Look, anybody that hasn't read it, I highly recommend Adventure Capitalist. Um, it was, uh, it was very formative for me. And I've been extremely uh, lucky and happy to have been able to develop a, a really great relationship with Jim. And I've learned a lot from him personally over the years. And, and, uh, I think, that book really does espouse that investment ethos. You know, if you want to, if you want to find, if you want to find that golden nugget, if you want to find the diamond in the rough, you got to be willing to put a few miles under your belt, um, and you know, or at least learn about the different opportunities in the world. And you can't just really. Ex- Expect that Google's going to serve it up, you know, in a nice, neat little platter, or that uh, you know, some guy on CNBC is going to, you know, going to tell you all the, you know, the great investments that that exist in the world. You know, you have to be willing to put in the time and effort, um, like anything in life. You know, mm-hmm. all the all the great things in life really do come when you apply yourself and learn and put in the time and effort uh, to be able to generate the return. Yeah, definitely. So you're a really popular man in our circles uh, and sovereign man as well. As oh, well, you are you and sovereign man are the same in, in uh, one sense. But we a lot of us had a opportunity to see you speak at a conference in Bangkok a few years back. And the great thing was that a lot of the people in that oh the, the the one I did with uh, the one I did with Derek yeah uh, yeah exactly uh, Derek yeah, Silvers okay. yeah. and um, and Dynamite Circle and. Yeah, that was the best conference that of that group. I think everyone, everything since then has, has gotten a little too broad, but that was a really good group. And I don't know, that was maybe three years ago. A lot of people from that group, um, have gone on to build very successful businesses and are now taking their own sovereignty for say much more serious. So uh, I know a lot since that, since that actual conference, a lot of people have been following sovereign man. So, you know, as a group, we wanted to thank you and hopefully we're reading this and more importantly, practicing this stuff, uh, 20 years from now well i mean look i hope so it, it sounds 
it sounds hokey. I'll, I'll be honest with you, and and I recognize that. But uh, you know, in my in my own background, I used to be in the military, and mm-hmm. you know, I had some. It was it it was a in many respects a, an incredible experience. But I also had the darkest days of my life, were you know were during those those years, mm-hmm. and um, you know where I felt trapped. I felt like uh, I mean it was just 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 a lot of very um, bad experiences. And I remember. Sure coming out of that thinking i will never never be in this position ever again you know where i'm not in control of my life and my choices and my decisions um and at the end of the day that kind of boils down to personal freedom Mm -hmm. and so again as hokey as it might sound it's actually become for me um you know one of the most important things in my life and you know for you know your listeners and people that have gone on to build successful businesses and so forth um you know it's it, it it is something that you know that you can do the, the essentially the more you know when you achieve financial success you you do start to uh, realize how many more options you have and if you make good decisions then you can achieve that I mean, if you make good investment decisions and, and good personal decisions you can really uh, ensure that you're that you're in that position to uh to be in complete and total control of your own life and your own choices hmm. so would you say that your experience in intelligence in the military is what turned you on to starting sovereign man uh, well, so, I mean, starting Star Man was a uh, was a long series of events mm-hmm. and people that I met and so forth. But it really all started, yeah, with my with my experiences in the army, um, and and realizing that I just didn't want to be in that uh, in that position ever again where I wasn't in control. When our listeners realize that you're coming on the show, a plethora of questions were coming in. Surprisingly, a lot were around buying and storing gold, which, you know, there's so many unknown things. There's a huge debate about should you buy shares of gold or should you buy bullion and and how to do that? What's what's your perspective on owning precious metals? Uh, It always starts with, uh, you know, with the point. What's the point? Why, why, you know, why own something like that? You know, Warren Buffett's been very critical about it. You know, he says, well, you know, why would you own this stuff? You know, you, you pay a bunch of money to dig it out of the ground, you know, then you pay a bunch of money to dig a hole somewhere else where you put it back in the ground where it's guarded with guys like guns that you also have to pay, you know, what's, what's the point? You can't Mm -hmm. do anything with it. The, the things that he says about it, you go, okay, well, the guy's got a point. The larger issue is that, um, what's your alternative right now when we think of, when we think of money, as I try and explain to people this way, when we think about money, uh, there are there are ultimately different forms of money. We think about cash in our pockets. You're in Ukraine right now, so you've got uh, Ukrainian hryvna. Uh, people have U.S. dollars or euros, or rubles, whatever it is, right? So there's cash in our pockets. There's also money in our banks, okay? So we've got, most of us probably have bank accounts with savings, deposits, uh, certificates of deposits, whatever we've got in our bank accounts. We might have mutual funds, money market funds. Some people, uh, particularly at the institutional level, really, really rich guys, uh, businesses, treasury departments, you know, uh, Apple's corporate treasury and so forth. These guys own government bonds, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, They'll own U.S. Treasury securities and 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 uh, you know British gilts and these sorts of things. Um, these are all essentially different forms of money. Every one of those carries uh, some degree of counterparty risk. Um, physical cash carries some degree of counterparty risk mm-hmm. because it is something that can be. Uh, it's, it's something that I mean they, they you know they've done this uh, you know a number of times. I mean many places around the world are trying to ban cash outright and just get rid of it all together. They're mm-hmm. doing a pretty damn good job of this uh, uh, across Europe. Um, you know this is ultimately something that's controlled by central bankers. They decide that they can make interest rates negative. They can regulate. It. They can do all kinds of things uh, with physical cash. Bank deposits are another form of money. Um, right now, there is essentially a one-to-one exchange rate between physical cash and your bank deposit. Mm-hmm. You know, if you go to an ATM machine and pull out a thousand bucks, you know that's a thousand dollars from your bank deposit, a thousand dollars physical cash in your hand. Um, you know, the issue is is that if you look at banks, and you don't have to go too far back in recent history to find out that banks aren't really all they're cracked up to be. They're supposed to be these paragons of safety and stability and so forth, but under the surface, that's actually not really true. Um, that if you really do the deep dive into bank balance sheets, you'll find that they're extremely liquid, that in many cases, banks are uh, poorly capitalized, undercapitalized, or even insolvent. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they kind of pretend that everything's all good until there's that, you know, there's that Lehman Brothers moment, or there's that Cypress moment where they say, oh, hey, sorry, guys, we're bankrupt, and, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to go under, we're going to take your money, we're going to freeze all your accounts, and so forth. You know, why take the risk? I mean, what's the, what what's the point? You know, you're dealing with interest rates, you, you know, you're, if you're lucky enough to get 10 basis points in a savings account, you know, why take that risk? Your bank deposit can be confiscated. Uh, you know, if you get on the wrong side of some government agency's mm-hmm. list, if you get sued, you know, and if you're running a business, 
you basically have a please come and sue me sign, uh, you know, on your back. And, uh, you know, anybody can be sued for anything at any time. And if you keep all of your money in a bank, you know, what people have to realize is that as depositors of a bank, you know, it's not your money anymore. That money belongs to the bank. You become an unsecured creditor mm-hmm. of the bank. And so, you know, the best thing you can do is try and eliminate a lot of that counterparty risk. And one of the best ways to do that is with gold. Gold's not something that can be conjured out of thin air by any central bank. They can't, you know, they're, they're not regulating interest rate policy as it, as it pertains to gold. They're not, um, you know, they're not creating new ounces of gold. You know that sort of that sort of thing is is uh, is is well beyond what central banks are able to do or control, um, and so gold is just it's one of the only asset classes in the world. It's got a five thousand year history of, of value and marketability. You can take an ounce of gold anywhere in the world, whether you're in Ukraine uh, or the United States or in Santiago, Chile, uh, or in China or anywhere else you go to, and that gold is going to have value. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was funny as I was actually having this conversation with Jim a few weeks ago in Singapore, and we were talking about this. You know, and I said, well, I can't, you know, I can't pull out a, an ounce of gold and pay for dinner. You know, I can't, I can't buy this dinner or a bottle of wine with an ounce of gold, but I can sure as hell trade it really quickly, um, especially in a place like Singapore, really, really quickly for whatever medium exchange I need to conclude the transaction, you know, or pay mm-hmm. for dinner. And gold's pretty much the, it's the only, it's really the only truly universal asset class um, around the world that is that liquid but decentralized to the point that it's not controlled by any single institution or central bank. Yeah, interesting. I, I just came from Singapore as well, and I bought gold at the, uh, I think it's UOB, the UOB Bank downtown in the financial district at the UOB building. And if you go downstairs, yep. you can buy it right there at the bank. Uh, is it, right. like If you wanted to sell a piece of gold from that you bought, say, at UOB or any other place in a place like Singapore, is it pretty easy to find a place that will, will buy that somewhere spot on in the day? Yeah, I mean, Singapore is so, uh, I mean, the average Singaporean is so financially sophisticated, it wouldn't surprise me if you would just be able to unload it on the street. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, getting, get, you know, getting rid of gold, you know, liquidating gold and uh, turning it into paper currency or bank deposits or one of these other forms of money mm-hmm. that we're talking about um, is very, very easy. And again, gold is, is pretty much one of the only um, asset classes that is universally uh, uh, able to be, you know, liquidated mm-hmm. so quickly at the drop of a hat. You know, you're, you're, there's always a market everywhere in the world for gold, um, and so because it is the, you know, it is, it is a, um, you know, the, you could you could argue that you know something like Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies might have that that future, and there's a lot of markets for that all over the world. But you know, gold is gold is very universal, um, and so being able to to do that is is a tremendous benefit, and you know, one of the reasons why it makes so much sense. Um, generally gold again is a safe haven so Mm -hmm. if you kind of if you have a view of the world that they're probably going to accumulate more debt they're probably going to print more money uh they may even try and make interest rates even more negative and so forth if you if you if you see that sort of long-term uh trajectory gold is definitely something that makes a lot of sense even without that long-term trajectory it certainly does make a lot of sense to have to have the ultimate universal currency uh that no matter where you go in the world you know, you're able to turn that into uh, local legal tender, and mm-hmm. and gold is is basically the only thing you can that you can do that with, and so it does make a lot of sense uh, to own that. And when you buy gold yourself, are you buying a specific coin or uh, coinage or mint or? It makes diversify. sense to stick to yeah. It makes sense to to stick to the most universally recognizable forms. Mm-hmm. So buying, you know, if you if you see these, you know, these gigantic bars um, and so forth that people that people get, you know, sometimes you just can go into hundreds of ounces and so mm-hmm. forth. Th- those don't necessarily make a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, buying buying a you know buying a one ounce you know Canadian maple leaf gold coin. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, th- that's generally my my bread and butter. I I usually buy those. Um, you know, because no matter where you go in the world, everybody knows Canadian maple leaf gold coin. A lot of countries have little, you know, kind of particular gold coins, and there are some obviously more famous than others. You know, U.S. Um, eagles and buffaloes, uh, mm-hmm. uh, sovereign uh, coins in the United Kingdom, um, Austrian philharmonics, Australian kangaroos, Chinese pandas, these sorts of things. You, you stick to the major ones, you'll be able to unload that in a second. Um, maple leaves are my favorite, just because uh, there are they are you know the purity is so high. 
and they're just so recognizable that you'll be able to go in anywhere. If you if you if you haul in like a giant bar somewhere, mm-hmm. it's going to need to be tested and assayed and all these sorts of things because you know who knows what's in there. Um, you bring in a gold coin, uh, a maple leaf. You know, any dealer in the world, anybody who knows anything about gold, they'll you know you'll be able to to liquidate that in a second. It's not going to take any time at all, and so it's just it's it's very convenient. Mm-hmm. You know, they're easy to travel with as well. So does it ever make sense to buy a larger size? in a bar like if you had say 30 grand does it make sense just to buy a bar is there are there that many pros to doing so uh i look at gold as again we're talking about a, a universal form of money so the way i look at gold is the same way that i would look at any other kind of money so let's say you have us dollars right it makes sense to have us dollars in your pocket in your wallet right you i mean i'm a guy like i hold a lot of cash mm-hmm. so you know i've got a lot of cash but i also you know i also maintain bank deposits and so to me, it's the same thing with gold, and I think particularly those those smaller denomination coins, one ounce, even half an ounce uh, coins like maple leaves and so forth, that's sort of like a cash equivalent um, for me. So it's something that same as I would look at cash I'm walking around in my in my billfold. Not that I would necessarily walk around everywhere with you know $30,000 worth of gold on mm-hmm. me, but yeah, I'd probably something I keep in my safe, uh, which I do tend to keep a lot of that stuff in my safe. Then there's sort of like the, the bank deposit equivalent for gold. And the, to me, the bank deposit equivalent for gold is the kind of gold that I would keep in a private vault um, somewhere mm-hmm. that – uh, you know that's you know that is secure. You know I generally prefer private vaults to bank safety deposit boxes uh, because they're not uh, you know they're not essentially you know, regulated by all kinds of government agencies and so forth. So it's a little more secure and and and, and better for asset protection purposes. Um, but that kind of gold is what I would consider to be more like a bank deposit. And for that sort of thing, yeah, okay, sure larger bars and those sorts of things if, if it was going to be something that i was going to hold like savings for a long time mm-hmm. i wouldn't have any problem holding bars you know you can get but uh, you can get kilo bars and, and and all sorts of things and there are there are some bars that are a lot more popular than others you get these credit suisse bars and so forth but uh, i think for the for the average you know gold owner just just having some coins is something that makes a lot of sense some people go overboard with gold um you know i know guys that you know, they put i mean they People have told me they put 100% of their net worth in gold, and uh, I, you know, that's something I don't know really makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, your instinct kind of has to be your guide on on that. You know, what I tell people is, if you're constantly fretting about the gold price, if you have an app on your phone that's constantly <laughs> updating you of what the gold <laughs> price is, then you probably own too much. You know, you <laughs> yeah. honestly own too much. I would actually say that's the same with all investments. You know, if you if your if your stock portfolio is so vast and and such a big percentage of your net worth that you're constantly you know checking the, at the S&P and the Dow Jones industrial average then you probably own too many stocks mm-hmm. and you might need to lighten your load and that's your instincts telling you that you know it's time to it's time to take some money off the table uh, and, uh, and and that your you know your risk is too high and, and I think that, that that rule of thumb applies with just about anything in any asset class makes a lot of sense so the, the first piece of gold I ever bought was about three years ago and it was after starting to read sovereign man and I was in Hong Kong and I went to get a safety deposit box. And I didn't realize that to get a safety deposit box somewhere in in basically in Central or on Hong Kong Island or even Kowloon, the waiting list is like five years plus. Oh, um, yeah. But I ended up getting one about a year later. Uh, it's uh, over in Mong Kok. And so when I got it, I immediately went to and found a piece, uh, a place to buy uh, a gold coin. I think it was a place called Kitco. Bought one gold coin, put it in the safety box. It was a it was a really fun kind of scavenger hunt in a way. But for somebody who is just looking to buy their first maybe one or two pieces of, of gold, it's going to be different, of course, everywhere in the world. Is there a suggested path you have? Let's say someone's in North America, they just want to they just want to buy one or two pieces of gold to get their feet wet. Is there a kind of an easy turnkey way to do that to get the gold purchased? Oh yeah, I mean, there's a million ways to do that. You can go down to, I mean, a lot of people have. Uh, you know, there's coin dealers that are you know right nearby mm-hmm. where they live. Um, there's places you can go. I mean, you can, you can buy gold off of Amazon and eBay. I yeah. mean, honestly, there's, there's a million places to buy gold. You know, you can find there's a lot of places online. Um, I think you mentioned Kidco. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a place you, you can you can order this stuff online. They'll deliver it to your house. Um, so it's, it's very very easy to do. And you know, just you know, start easy, start small. Mm-hmm. And you know, if it seems like a lot, say, eh, I don't really feel like spending you know fourteen hundred bucks on a gold coin. Okay, fine. Buy some silver. You know, I mean, yeah. everybody's got twenty bucks, man. So, so <laughs> right. buy some silver. Yeah, I mean, buy some silver and uh, uh, you know, and start start with that. And that's it's it's easy to get started that way. You know, you own some silver and uh, mm-hmm. you know, between the two of them, the way I 
usually try and explain to people is that gold's a little bit more stable. If you know, if you're interested in the in the paper currency price, the price of silver is probably going to go up more and faster than gold, and that's certainly bared out over certainly this year. I mean, silver's been one of the best performing mm-hmm. asset classes in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing goes up or down in a straight line, and what I always tell people is, you know, if 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 your whole idea is to buy gold, uh, hoping that it goes up in value so that you can sell it and put more paper money in your pocket, you're kind of missing the point. The whole idea of gold is to trade in your paper money for something else that's not regulated by central bankers, uh, something that's actually real and does have that you know, universal quality to it. So it just makes sense to own and hold for the long term, regardless of, I, I mean, I couldn't care less if gold went to 1,000 or if it went to 2,000, mm-hmm. it's not going to matter, it's not going to affect my behavior uh, at all or make me say, oh man, I got to go out and sell this. You know, that's not really the, that's not really the point. The point is to have something, again, that's, it's that universal um, asset class, in many respects, kind of an insurance policy, you know, but a form of money that's that stood the test of time uh, for thousands of years, mm-hmm. and, and it just makes sense to be at least a portion of somebody's portfolio. Now you can always uh, turn it into a nice, pretty watch if uh, if if for any reason you just <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to trade it in. But uh, you touched yeah. on you touched on Bitcoin earlier. I got to ask: Are you are you buying any Bitcoin? And if so, in what ratio to precious metals? Oh, I mean, I own Bitcoin. Um, it's it, it's not a it's not a huge thing. I own Bitcoin, and uh, it's probably similarly almost as a bit of an insurance policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do I hold Bitcoin in the same way that I hold gold. I've got some just like right here in my mobile phone with a, with a Bitcoin wallet app. But most of my Bitcoin is actually in cold storage. Um, you know, it's just on a piece of paper that's locked inside of my safe. That's really interesting. And, uh, yeah, because. Um, I lost I lost like twenty eight coins in Mount Gox when Mount Gox went down. Now it's going through the bankrupt CBS, but that's that really sucked. <laughs> and like, how, yeah, you know, I, I'll be honest, you know? I, I never, I never really, yeah, I never really got that about about Bitcoin. I, I, I look at those things and I go, I don't understand why anybody does that. Mm-hmm. You know, why does anybody use you know those services? Because one of the beauties of Bitcoin, I think, is that with Bitcoin you can be your own bank. Mm-hmm. You know, with Bitcoin you can you can easily take it into cold storage, lock it up in a safe, or if you're a brainiac, you just memorize the digits and uh, the all the alphanumeric characters, and you know, and that's it. And so you can be your own bank in a way that's the equivalent of having you know having a certificate of deposit. You know, what I've basically got, I've got Bitcoin sitting in my safe. You know, I basically have a certificate of deposit um, mm-hmm. and something that I can, you know, anytime I want to, I can go into my safe, you know, I can bring, you know, Bitcoin, uh, you know, back, load up however much I want onto my phone and then st- store the rest of it right back into cold storage. So if I ever need to use it and spend it, it's sort of the same thing like I would with, with cash. You know, I could just take the take the money out of an ATM machine. Um, I could do the same thing and just sort of load up from cold storage pull it back onto my mobile phone, you know, bring it into, uh, you know, into my, into my wallet app and, and just cruise around and, and pay, you know, for whatever I got to pay for that way. Um, and so I, I do it in the same way. I'm not a, you know, the, I'm not a huge, uh, I, I'm not the world's biggest Bitcoin guy by, mm-hmm. by any stretch. Um, and by the way, I'm not the world's biggest gold guy either. I, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, probably have about as much bitcoin as i do gold um you know but mostly the things that i'm that i'm looking for i mean i look at both of these as just different forms of money um in the same way that you know dollars and euros and renminbi are kind of different forms of money Mm -hmm. i mean these are just basically different kinds of currency in a way they have different benefits uh and different attributes and characteristics being decentralized and and unregulated and so forth and so that's i'm I'm drawn to that but i don't view them as investments really because i'm not looking to Mm -hmm. buy bit for X and sell it for 10X. Um, it's just something that is, again, some kind of form of money. I remember when I was cruising around one time, um, I had uh, I was down at one of our farms uh, here in Chile, and I left my wallet there um, at the house, at the farm, and I drove all the way back to Santiago, and I got most of the way to Santiago, and I thought, oh, shit, you know, I left my wallet. Mm-hmm. But I knew I was okay, because I thought, well, you know, I've got a mobile phone full of, you know, I've got plenty of... I, probably had, I don't know, at least a couple grand worth of Bitcoin on my mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Um, So I knew I was going to be okay, that no matter what, it was, you know, it was fine. And, um, and I had cash in my safe and so forth as well. But I just, again, I viewed Bitcoin as just some form of money that way. If I'm really looking to make a return on investment, I'm going to go and buy some productive asset. Um, And I don't, again, I don't view gold and Bitcoin as necessarily productive assets, just as forms of money. And that's my, I might have a slightly different view um, uh, on those. I think for investment purposes, I'm much better off buying, you know, agricultural property, uh, shares of uh, private businesses and these sorts of things. Those are my preferred types of investments, not 
necessarily you know bitcoin you know speculating in the bitcoin price yeah well, you, you also mentioned the bank of cyprus earlier i knew i had a previous business partner that lost millions in that and people very seldomly talk about cyprus it's like it happened it was a big deal and now everyone's totally forgot about it and i guess the only yeah, reason yeah it's the only reason i remember it is because it hits so close to home and from that point forward i was like you know this could happen anywhere right uh and this guy literally lost many millions of dollars and he got back basically a check for a hundred thousand euros and, and that's it and, and there's there's no repercussions and then around the same time i lost money in um in mount gox and there was it's not nearly as much money but you know what was what was mount gox before it was bitcoin it was like a magic card exchange or something but right. a lot of stuff that you talk about is just you know finding out not necessarily don't having not having trust in other people but finding out smarter ways to do it and taking your own sovereignty into your own hands. Um, so all stuff that we'd love to hear about. And you do a you do a camp in, I think it's in Lithuania every year, that's called Sovereign Academy, yeah? Yeah, we've been doing that for, we just finished the, our seventh year of doing that. I basically bring out the smartest, uh, most talented, most successful uh, friends of mine, and uh, we spend a week with uh, students from all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, just basically trying to uh, teach them as much as we can about uh, business, finance, investing, uh, you know, entrepreneurship, freedom, etc. And uh, it's uh, it's it's great. It's it's a it's a wonderful experience for me, for my fellow uh, instructors, and mm -hmm. I. We just love it. And uh, I know for many, many, many of our students, it's been absolutely life-changing so yeah. how many it, students cool. do you, how many students are are they students or are they startups that come to the camp uh no they're individuals it's mm -hmm. not it's not like somebody has to have a business or, or something like that mm -hmm. um they have that for example like here in chile they have startup chile where you have to have your startup and your business and so forth and we're very very friendly with those guys um at startup chile and, and, and work with them from time to time um with this we're investing in people i'm mm -hmm. investing in uh in, in the jockey not the horse so um it's something that you know i i pay for it myself i bring everybody out for for that sort of thing and and we have about 50 usually 50 some odd students every year it's very competitive to get in you know mm -hmm. the application process is pretty pretty substantial and you know our selection rates probably i would say less than 10 percent at this point um so it's it's a uh, it's a pretty competitive thing but it's 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 great it gets better every single year mm -hmm. uh every year i say i cannot possibly imagine it getting any better and it does um you know but a lot of that's because the, you know the quality of students keeps getting better mm -hmm. um but also i think you know we the instructors we've done more uh and experienced more you know every year you know we're you know we're rising too we're we're constantly learning and doing and growing mm -hmm. and progressing and so it, it it makes the overall experience much better you know how what's the outcome of of that uh, academy each year do you end up investing in in some of these these individuals and businesses or oh yeah i've i've <laughs> I've, yeah, I've invested in a lot of them a lot of their companies a lot of them have uh, have actually ended up working for us in some capacity mm -hmm. and then we've gone on later and bought other businesses for them to go and run and and you know all kinds of things so it's it's been uh it's 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 been really really interesting awesome stuff so that kind of leads into one of the the biggest questions that everyone wants to know about is what are you, you, t you t talked about precious metal, a little bit Bitcoin, agricultural projects and all these, all these other really exciting things. What is it wh like? What does your asset allocation model look like? Like your personal one? Oh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a big guy in private businesses. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's really where it's at. I think, um, investing in a private business, I think private a business is the best asset, uh, I think that anybody can own. And if you think about it, in good times, uh, you know, a private business is, is, is successful. It's throwing off lots of cash. Uh, in times of, you know, in rocky times, if you think about an inflationary episode, a private business is a real asset, so it's going to go up in value. In deflationary times, a private business throws off cash, which is the most valuable thing to have in a deflationary episode. In times of, you know, recession, that's actually something to look forward to. If you're a smart, you know, if you're a smart person, or if you own a great business, mm -hmm. a recession is something to look forward to because a recession is going to wipe out everybody else. Right. Recessions wipe out your competitors. Recessions wipe out all the idiots who shouldn't be in business. And everybody who's running a business knows, um, and God, I know it for sure, that mm -hmm. there's all kinds of idiots in your industry that shouldn't be there. Uh, and you know, and, and when bad times come, you know, all those guys get wiped out. And it's the it's the great 
businesses that are managed by talented people of integrity, you know, those are the businesses that stand the test of time and emerge from recessions even more successful than ever. Mm -hmm. So this is why, you know, because because private businesses ultimately come down to people, you know, and that's that's really the best capital of all. Paper currency, you know, we're talking about we talk about investing. We're talking about oh yeah, let's uh, what do we where do we put our paper currency to you know to turn X into two X and ten X and so forth. Paper currency is 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 you know is is I mean, it's infinite. I mean, it's in such tremendous abundance. It's something that people conjure out of thin air. A bunch of unelected bureaucrats push a button and create trillions of dollars like it's nothing. And it is nothing. Paper currency is fundamentally worthless. The the scarce resource in the world is talent. And that's ultimately, when you own a great business, that's really what you've got. You've got talent. And not just a little bit, but a lot. You know, all the businesses that I've got, and I've got a lot of businesses, every one of them's got just absolutely brilliant people Mm -hmm. um, that are involved um, in running it and you know that's really what sets these things apart and so you know that's fundamentally the investment that's why we do the entrepreneurship camp because i'm Mm -hmm. always interested in talent i'm finding you know where's the next great talent um, and trying to attract those guys into my circle how long is how long is the actual academy each year it's it's in lithuania in august i believe or Uh, july august every year yeah so yeah it's for five days but the whole idea is that it's in many respects kind of a Mm -hmm. self-selection mechanism in that in that uh you know the guys that you know the, the, the the guys and girls that show up to this thing you know they're already incredibly talented people you know they're sort of the cream of the cream mm-hmm. of the cream you know but then it's sort of out of that emerges you know people that sort of rise to the top of that and and those are the guys that sort of continue to build and maintain relationships with us and uh that's kind of the thing that i tell everybody every year i said hey why do you think we do this you know why do why do i spend you know tens of thousands of dollars and you know several days of my time and everybody else's mm-hmm. time who comes out to do this why do we do this you know we do this because we're interested in relationships mm-hmm. and again it's all about it's all about that you know that talent and i think is the scarcest resource of all i think relationships are so important uh, and to me you know some of the best investments that you can make you know are these investments you make in other people and relationships and talent and so forth so many great things in our lives happen because of who we know not because of our bank balance mm-hmm. but because of who we know we're t- we learn things that make a huge difference in our lives because of who we know we get into businesses and do things all these wonderful things that happen in many cases you know people's uh, spouses and significant others and so forth because of you know they met because of people who they know great jobs great experiences all these things because of who we know which is such a great thing to invest Invest in uh, investing in relationships, uh, and that's why we do it. Um, and great relationships come out of it. And you know, we we've ended up with you know, relationships that mm-hmm. last for years and years that we continue to invest in. And you know, great things have come from those. So you you have the Sovereign Academy. <laughs> you mentioned you have uh, you're in close with the guys who run Startup Chile. Have you ever thought about doing your own like Ch- Chile or anywhere else kind of incubator where you invite? individuals and startups to come in and kind of work under you for a few months <laughs> what makes you think i haven't <laughs> oh well there you go <laughs> no, yeah no we've 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 basically got that it's a bit informal but uh yeah essentially that's what we have down here uh, essentially you know okay. we've got uh staff resources uh you know the the office the infrastructure the capital all, all kinds of things that we've uh you know kind of gone out to you know to really invest heavily in people because look uh you know we invest in. I, I try and invest in people, and mm-hmm. like I invest in startups. I try and grab people at, at a you know earlier in their careers and help coach and guide and, right. and mentor them. Um, and uh, running a business like investing, I would I would say, is a skill, and it's 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 a skill that has to be acquired. It's a strange thing, you know. I've got friends. I was telling a story to a buddy of mine who's a, he's a, he's a bariatric surgeon. And his name's Michael, and mm-hmm. you know Michael just did, you know wake up one day and say, "Hey, you know I've got an idea, um, you know to cut people open. So let me just you know hand me that butter knife, and I'm going to start operating on people." No, that's not how it works. You know you got to study, you got to work hard, you got to, you know you need to you need to intern, you need to have mm-hmm. residency, you need to really learn how to conduct bariatric surgery, and then after years and years of working your ass off and building this skill. Only then are you actually qualified to do it. Running a business is the same. Investing is the same. These are skills. You don't just roll out of bed in the morning and mm-hmm. say, oh, I've got an idea. But this is a lot of people do this. They roll out of bed and they say, i got an idea. They come up with an idea for a business and think that that qualifies them to run a business. And it doesn't because most people, again, running a business, starting a business, this is a skill. Um, and it's a skill that needs to be acquired. 
most people don't have it because most people, you know, we don't grow up around it. We don't learn it in school, right? So how's mm-hmm. anybody really know? You know? We can either sort of try and fail Absolutely. or we can try and learn. We can actually treat it like a skill, like surgery, and treat it like a skill. Investing is the same way. Most people don't have this skill, right? It has to be learned like anything else, like driving a car, like cooking, like anything else, right? We have to learn how to invest. We have to learn how to run a business. And they don't teach this stuff in school, and most people don't grow up around mm-hmm. it. So it is. I think it's pretty critical to learn this stuff. And you know, I think this is, for me, this is why you know, we do try and incubate companies. And ultimately, what we're doing is trying to invest in the, the knowledge and the resources of people that might you know, they've got great ideas, they've got great energy, but might not necessarily have the, the skills. And again, I do think the same thing applies to investing. It's why it's so critical to really learn and, you know, why what you're doing, you know, even with this podcast is very cool to help people learn more about investing because it is a skill. It's a skill that can be acquired, but it is a skill that people have to recognize needs to be acquired. And I think a lot of people jump into business just like they jump into investing mm-hmm. without having the skill. And that's where very dangerous things can happen. Yeah, you know, absolutely. especially with investing, you can lose a lot of money very quickly by thinking that you have the skill when you actually don't have the skill. As we have, as we have. <laughs> sure. <laughs> everyone right. has their, and, everyone uh, has their fails in it, I'm sure, at one point. Uh, Simon, are you partial towards investing in, f- as an investor, are you partial towards uh, businesses with a asset, like a physical asset class, a tangible asset, such as a product, property, versus a digital business? Well, I do, uh, you know, all, all of the above. Mm-hmm. Um, so we invest pretty heavily in um, in startups uh, that essentially have no assets at all, mm-hmm. except for the raw talent of the founders and, you know, perhaps some intellectual property. It's not the biggest. I mean, the, the nice thing about those is that, you know, 10, 20 grand, you know, you're you're kind of, you know, you got a good position and, and that can, you know, that can pay very outsized returns. So they we're talking about small chunks and, mm-hmm. and chip shots, really. Um, in dealing with where we buy entire businesses, we, you know, which we've bought, you know, three in the last, I don't know, year probably, uh, and started several as well. So, you know, we bought a retail apparel company in Australia, uh, for example, and, uh, you know, bought the entire business. And, and the great thing about private businesses is that the valuations on these things are so inexpensive. You yeah. know, I basically bought this thing for like one times earnings and it was a incredibly profitable company. I mean, doing extremely well, one times earnings. Less well, that, than book but that's, value. That's, be, that's because you're Simon Black, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> you I mean, wanted to buy it, it'd be it required, ten times. <laughs> uh, well, it just it required it required a lot of patience. You yeah. know, doing private deals requires a lot of patience. It's not like you can just go and log into your into your brokerage account and buy you know shares of Apple or whatever that's easily tradable yeah. and so forth. This is you know the private business. I mean. It, one of my one of my um, previous business partners. One of the things I learned from him, he used to say, you know, no deal worth doing doesn't fall apart at least three times. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and this one probably fell apart six or eight times. Wow! Um, but we had to stuck. Yeah, we stuck it out. It took a year to get the deal closed, but uh, but it's been absolutely phenomenal. Um, huge, just a, a massive cash cow. And um, you know, this is the kind of thing that you can do with private businesses in a private mm-hmm. business. You know, I you know, I've got most brilliant, perfect CEO in the world who's down there um, running it, and it means that you know we basically have complete and total control over everything. With when I when I if I invest in you know if I buy shares of uh, you know whatever of Apple, I don't have any control over that. Tim Cook's an incredibly smart and talented guy. All these people at Apple are incredibly smart and talented people, but I don't have any control over that. Um, you know, I have I have uh, you know the, the the fewer counterparties that are involved to me, the less risk there is. And so when I can get a mature business that's been around for for twenty years and generating seven figures in net mm-hmm. income, and be in total control to see all this low hanging fruit and say, hey, well, let's tweak this and let's change this, and just do a couple of things, you know, to to cut some costs and you know boost the revenue a little bit more and and make substantial movements to the to the bottom line and have the have all the authority and flexibility and control to be able to do that. And that's a great position to be in. And so um, those are the things that I like to own because, again, I, I have so much ability to control the and influence the outcome of that. I love it. You definitely have something special going on there. So one thing we don't talk about enough on the podcast is private investment, largely because 
it's one of the more difficult things to invest in if you've never done it before. So a lot of our audiences, you know, 20 to 40 years old have, have their own business that they've invested in, uh, have right. started generating money, have passive income or have, have a little bit of money they want to invest in. But, you know, structuring that first deal, especially if it's, it's a deal in another country or, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit, it's a little bit dicey to get into your first deal. So I got to ask, you know, with all the stuff that you're doing on the private level, I mean, does that take a, a large team to organize all this with legal and, um, and and just following up with them and stuff? We've been doing it for so long, so mm-hmm. I've got teams of guys that do that. The guy I'm, I'm knocking on my wall right now, he's sitting next to me in the in the next office over, so mm-hmm. he sort of runs the show uh-huh. with all our private investment side. And, and you know, I've got, got analysts and, and legal guys and things like that. But but at the end of the day, it ultimately comes down to uh, uh, it comes down to deal flow. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and again, one of the reasons why I, when I said in the beginning of the podcast, why I travel. I travel to go and actually find a lot of those opportunities um, and see where the opportunities are and say, okay, is there something here that I can invest in or is there some kind of business or something that we can start here? Mm-hmm. Um, Chile, you know, we, I started the, you know, the agriculture thing because I looked around here and said, hey, this is great. Agriculture land here is, the, is, is just as good as it is in California. You know, it's the best agricultural property in the world. And yet it's a you know, a fraction of the price. You know, people pay thirty, forty thousand dollars an acre in California. I'll pay two thousand dollars here. Um, you know, my land costs are lower, my investment costs are lower, my operating costs are lower. You know, I mean, the the, the, the wage costs here mm-hmm. are nothing compared to what they are in North America. Um, and yet, you know, the price of of our produce, walnuts, blueberries, etc. This stuff is, you know, these are global market prices. So we get the same price, even higher prices than they do in North America. So the profitability goes through the roof. So again, I mean, just kind of looking around the world, when you start, when you start seeing this stuff with your own eyes, you start finding really how many great opportunities there are that go beyond, oh, let me just buy some shares of Netflix at 350 times earnings. Um, <laughs> you know, when you really start looking, there are so many great, unique options out there. Um, you know that uh, you know that people can get involved in, and and uh, I would I would suggest you know for example that a lot of your listeners, I mean people that have their own businesses, I mean you've developed your own skill set and and things that you understand. It always makes sense to invest in the things that you understand, and and so there are probably um, other businesses within your industry or at least in your space you know if you're if you're doing you know if you're running an e-commerce business or you're running you know some mm-hmm. you know anything online on the internet and you understand traffic and ad funnels and these sorts of things and you know there's probably a lot of those sorts of businesses that you might be able to acquire and you know find a, a smart operator to run and provide some strategic guidance uh, to really boost the you know boost the profits and just generate some additional uh, additional cash flow that way. So these sorts of things are really out there. I think if people are willing to to do the work and and um, you know and actually find it, or you know at least find some other people that might be able to help them with uh, with that sort of thing. So this this begs the question: What opportunities are there to potentially invest alongside of you or Sovereign Man, if any at all? Oh man, we've got uh, you know we've got a lot of things that we do with um, you know with people inside of our you know our kind of premium circles. So I mean we you know we just actually I think we just closed last friday some financing on a uh on actually a brazilian e-commerce company that's just i mean they've been growing 100 percent a year and doing a million a month and all kinds of stuff i mean they're, they're, they're doing extremely well so we invested in that one um taking a minority stake uh in that but i mean we, we i mean we do this stuff a lot mm-hmm. uh we've got hundreds of people that invested in our agriculture company and 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 all kinds of things so yeah there's there's uh, you know, we I mean, this is what we do mm-hmm. basically. I mean, we we travel around the world and try and find yeah, yeah. things that make sense, both on the you know what I kind of call the defensive side, and say you know, hey, look, there's there's a lot of risk out there. You know, you need to be careful. You know, your your government's probably bankrupt. Your banking system might not be all it's cracked up to be. So you know, take some take some steps that are suitable and 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 uh, you know make sense no matter what. You mm-hmm. know, for me, I say, look, you know, I've got some money that's in a bank that's extraordinarily well capitalized. It's liquid. That's solvent. That's backed by a government that has no debt and a jurisdiction that's never had a banking failure. There's no way that I'm worse off for that. You know, there's no way that I could say, oh, you know, I, I, I kind of joke with my own audience sometimes and say, you know, I never wake up in the morning and complain that my, you know, that my bank is too safe and conservative. Mm-hmm. You know, those words never come out of my mouth. Um, you know, so, you know, we try and encourage people to do those sorts of things. But, you know, once you sort of lick the, those risks, 
Um, you know, litigation is another one. They look, if you're living in the most litigious country that's ever existed in the history of the world, you might want to take a little bit of money off the table mm -hmm. and wrap it up in a, in a structure that makes it at least difficult, you know, at least to have some money that's sacrosanct and difficult, you know, to be to be seized just because some, you know, your neighbor's kid falls in your swimming pool or you got some disgruntled ex-employee that wants to sue you or all kinds of things that might happen. You know, having a little bit of money stashed away that's safe, you're not going to be worse off for that. But once you've done those things, you know, start looking around the world and seeing what the opportunities are. And I'm just super optimistic about all the things that I see mm -hmm. around the world, it's little niche industries and places and countries that nobody else is really looking. And, uh, you know, so that's that's exciting uh, for me and, and to be able to kind of come across those opportunities and, you know, share them with, uh, you know, a select group of people. It's, it's, that's pretty much what we do. I'll tell you what, Ukraine has been a total eye opener to me because I think it's got to be the best value in any country I've ever been to in terms of the quality of what you get for the price because also for the price yeah. it's, it's unbelievable I so I went to I had a buffet breakfast at the number one rated place in Lviv yesterday it was 90 whatever the Ukrainian money is which equ equates to about three dollars or something yeah it was the best buffet breakfast I've ever had in my life at this absolutely beautiful place with a pianist and champagne and and birds singing it was unbelievable so yeah I think the more you travel the more you see the more opportunities you see and I, I know so many of the listeners now are more interested in in what you're doing and especially on your your thoughts and mentality towards investing what, what's the best way for people to get a toe into seeing how you think about investments and learning more about what you're investing in oh well i mean uh yeah i mean they can just visit the site and sign mm -hmm. up for our uh for our list mm -hmm. um I'm not a super promotional guy, so, uh, but uh, that's, yeah, sovereignman.com. We talk about this sort of thing from time to time. We try and talk about both, mm -hmm. you know, the, the ways to sort of look at the risks and the threats that are out there and fix those, but at the same time also to say, hey, look, there's a lot of really cool opportunity out there. And, right. and uh, you know, those tend to be a little bit more, just to be clear, those tend to be a little bit more on the, on the you know with some of our premium products and things mm -hmm. like that but uh but we do talk about that in our in our free daily so. right and then you have you have uh tim price writes the editorial for for one of your premium products and then you also have the total access i believe as well yeah total access is uh i don't really like to use the term but uh you know people use the term mastermind mm -hmm. uh it's not really that but i mean it's sort of like our 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 highest level of uh of uh, you know membership and uh, you know it's where we kind of share all the private deals and and various investments and things that uh, you know I joke you know rule number one about total access is you do not talk about total access so <laughs> one, of our, one of our favorite movies <laughs> yes good good awesome well so. it's been an amazing show um, I know the listeners are going to have a, a a lot of follow up questions um, but I think again like you said the best way for anyone who's not make sure you subscribe to the newsletter. And uh, please keep the emails to Simon and Sovereign Man Light about your exciting new business and um, and all the great investment opportunities and how to invest alongside a Sovereign Man. But um, it's been a lot of fun, Simon. We really appreciate you coming on the show. We'll try to include uh, a lot of stuff in the show notes, uh, literature, material, links to your website. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to share with the audience before we take off? No, this has been uh, this has been great. Um, I had a good time and uh, happy to come back anytime. So I appreciate it. That's good stuff. Okay, well, enjoy your time in Santiago. Rest and relax. Enjoy your wine. And um, for the audience out there, we'll catch you again next week on another episode. Okay, thanks, Sam. Thanks, Simon. Wow, that was such a good episode. I, I, I'm I'm still blown away about how much this guy travels. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, man 120 countries can you imagine like i think i said uh, i just crossed 90 and i i am i'm like 89 but i don't really want to go to the next 30 like i just want to go back to the best ones right yeah but i mean the fact that he is continually to travel not just you know to check things off or say he's been there but because he's looking actively looking for better investments and great opportunities worldwide and to to reconnect with his network and make sure that's strong to me that is sound advice yeah i'm i'm so envious of his network man and he hangs out with with jim rogers a lot jim rogers dr famously drove a car around the entire world country to country and look for investment opportunities it's called adventure capitalist if you haven't read it read it super inspiring story and simon pretty much is the everyday life of that book he's traveling all the time and he's networking with all these international people and I mean, let's face it, Simon's a really cool guy. Like, I would love to do business with him. I'm sure a lot of young entrepreneurs, uh, startups, private business owners would love to do business with him as well. So he's obviously got a, a very good thing going. 
you know, he's actually so much more down to earth than I imagined him to be. I think from his writings, you know, he kind of seems like you know, uh, like the superior man, you know, like mm-hmm. he's like this, you know, smart guy who kind of knows, you know, knows what he's doing, obviously has a lot of money, but he, but on the, on the call, he's just so down to earth. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's great to do these things too, because you get to see people, you know, how they would be for a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or just a chit chat. Obviously he's got a, a very big business, a lot of businesses under his, um, under his name. So he's a busy guy. So it was, it was really good for him to come on the, on the show. And I mean, the biggest takeaway for me was, you know, the things that we always talk about, right? Invest in yourself, invest in private businesses. It's not always easy to invest in private businesses, but like he said, the greatest asset anyone can own is a business, right? In inflationary times, it grows in value. And in deflationary times, it generates lots of cash. And if it's a good business in a recession, you get to watch your competitors go out of business. Yeah. And if you're very smart about it, you can do re- you know, recession proof businesses as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, an example of that would be like a casino. Uh, I mean, obviously that's not mm-hmm. something everyone's going to get into, but <laughs> tobacco. There, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of businesses. Mm-hmm. If you really kind of just take your time to think about it, that do well in both a recession as well as, you know, when the economy is doing well. I mean, I think you're a perfect case of that as well, right? You're helping people grow their businesses in, in bad times. A lot of people want to learn how to take their own, uh, to to become self-employed, right? To start their own business. They want to get out of the system and not be relying on a paycheck from an employer. So I think, you know, what you've built in a lot of ways is recession proof. Yeah, that actually makes sense. I never really thought about it that way because I always kind of thought about it as, you know, when people, when the economy is doing well, people have kind of free free money to spend mm-hmm. um, to better themselves or on their education. But you're actually absolutely right. I, I bet you would do even better, you know, when you know, people realize they can't just hold on to that job that they're unhappy at and just collect that paycheck, that they have to actually build you know, become their own boss and, and build their own businesses. Well, let's see what does better in the next recession, your business or your Vanguard account. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not going to be my, my Vanguard account. <laughs> VTI getting hammered. I like it. By the way, as a f- kind of fun update, uh, I just wrote up my, my expenses and my income report uh, for the month on Johnny FD. And I didn't realize, but I just kept pouring money into Pure Street because I was so excited about it. <laughs> and I ended up spending $28,000 on Pure Street this month. Wow. In- investing or, investing. or le- lending, not spending, right? Yeah. So luckily, all that money was, you know, buying assets. Mm-hmm. Uh, so starting next month, hope, you know, it's gonna be exciting to, to kind of see that, you know, uh, start paying off. But man, I'm so glad it wasn't, you know, me spending 28 oh, grand on, yeah. on booze or clubs or something. Yeah. Well, we spent quite a bit of that last month as well on our little Eastern European excursion. Uh, but Pier Street has got, man, they have a lot more inventory now. I've been paying attention to it. My my money's fully invested, fully vested in that now. Um, so I don't have any free cash in there to, to get some of this new inventory but there's a lot of good stuff on that that's really exciting one to kind of pay attention to and watch watch their whole business develop and and um and be part of it yeah so if you guys haven't heard that episode make sure you guys go back go to investlikeaboss.com and look for the episode entitled pure street versus lending club uh and you can kind of find out why we're both so excited about that uh Mm -hmm. and i have one i have one yeah i have one quick uh update as well on on that front as well so since this episode and since the last one with uh joshua shop of uh ira uh i'm sorry from a complete ira i've gotten a new private investment and what i'm gonna do i was kind of inspired by both this episode and the, the one with josh sharp I'm going to put my full. I'm going to self-direct my IRA and put my my uh, full retirement savings into a private investment. It's an artificial intelligence company. I know the the uh, co-founder very well. I've done some business with him before, so I'm going to uh, eat eat our own dog food for say and um, and take the advice that we got in the last two episodes and uh, and run with it. Wow, I like it. I'm looking forward to seeing how that works out. It's it's, it's fun that every single episode one of us is going to do something uh any any action items that you're going to take from this episode with simon black yeah i think it's more just going into not being afraid to get involved in private investments it's it's always a lot more paperwork it's a lot more headaches as as even simon alluded to but you know that's where that's where returns are and that's where um, and that's where the real gems are. It's, we're not talking about uh, uh, striving to achieve six to eight uh, percent as we are kind of in our Vanguard accounts. We're talking about 
you know, being able to generate massive multiples two times, 10 times, 50 times, 100 times if you're investing in startups. So, uh, yeah, just kind of doubling down on that effort and trying to allocate a little bit more of my total assets into my own startups and into other private investments. I like it. I just listened to two startups pitch their ideas this morning. I'm in Berlin uh, cool. and I was at the co-working space where this morning they, they had like a uh, breakfast and you know beta test or whatever they call it yeah yeah that's awesome so what you, you had breakfast and then they there are startups pitching there yeah so it was at beta house which is the biggest co-working space here mm-hmm. um not necessarily the best place i would recommend i would tell everyone to go to coworker.com and check out some of the other ones instead mm-hmm. uh but they had a you know very cool event where i think it's every thursday or at least once a month where uh the startups i i, I think they are the ones that maybe pay for the breakfast i'm not sure who mm-hmm. but anyways it's free you get coffee some bagels and stuff and then you listen to two or three people pitch uh their ideas that's awesome uh, that's a really good concept i think more co-working spaces should adopt definitely so i'm gonna listen to this episode uh one more time <laughs> And I'll see you guys all in the boss lounge and people can, you know, you guys can talk about what you're going to do to prepare kind of uh, for the future. Um, Where are you now, Sam? I'm in Budapest. Uh, I'm going to be here for six weeks. That's a long time. Yeah, man. I'm going to miss you when you're on your cruise next week, too. It's going to be the longest we've gone without talking in a while. You know what? I, I, I'm not going to have internet on the cruise, but I have a feeling that at the port, some, I'll probably hop on somewhere. So don't miss <laughs> me too much. Uh, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, I just want to give a quick thank you to this month's winner of the $25 Amazon gift card. This month is actually someone from Australia. So if you are not from the US, don't worry. You can still win the gift card. Uh, if you are from you know, anywhere that Amazon delivers to, go ahead to send in that screenshot of your review and you'll be entered to win. And if you are not from the US, please kind of just make a note of which Amazon store you'd want that credit to. So Mm -hmm. this month is Monique Brock. She said, five stars, a mind opener. I'm really glad I came across this podcast. Sam and Johnny have helped me open my mind to new investment ideas and got me started in building my future wealth. Thanks guys. Cheers, Monique from the land down under. Nice. Thanks, Monique. And guys, please, if you haven't yet, uh, do us a favor, leave us a review. It really helps us get better and better guests on the show. In two weeks, we have the CEO of Betterment coming on um, and lots and lots of good people thereafter. So please leave us a review. Helps us out a lot and um, we'll keep trying to bring on better people to to share their knowledge with all of us. All right. Peace out, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.